say? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us in person and virtually. Um, my name is Sierra Height. I'm the Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Coley Museum. Um, and I'm really excited to be hosting this conversation tonight that's going to focus on intersections between visual art, science, and poetry, and maybe also how those intersections are showing up in this mm. exhibition that we're sitting in. Um, which is called The Poetics of Atmosphere, Lorna Simpson's Cloudscape, and other works from the collection. So really rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> and I'm joined tonight by Dave Epstein and Adjua Greaves. And the three of us are going to start off the hour being in conversation, talking about their work and about the exhibition. Um, but before we get into that, I just kind of want to give a brief introduction that will orient where we are um, before we start the conversation. So on behalf of the museum, I want to acknowledge that we're present on the unceded homelands of the Wabanaki people. Uh, the Colby Museum has made an ongoing commitment to building relationships with the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, and Abenaki peoples as part of its work to recognize the legacies of settler colonialism. Um, I'm really grateful to be a guest on these tribal lands, and I want to take a moment to express my respect to past, present, and future indigenous communities um, who've cared for their ancestral lands for millennia and will continue to do so for future generations. So the exhibition that we'll be discussing tonight, um, as is noted in its title, is anchored by the artist Lorna Simpson's video work Cloudscape, um, actually installed in the room behind me. Just to give a bit of background, um, I'm the curator of the exhibition, and in building the show, um, I wanted to bring in other works from the collection that would really tease out or complicate some of the ideas that emerged for me in watching the video. For those of you who have seen it already, um, it's a really, really rich artwork, so I think there are a bunch of different ways to engage with it. But for the show, I wanted to focus on the way that artists um, explore conceptions of atmosphere, in particular um, meteorology and weather. Um, and I also wanted to look into like visual articulations of weight, weightlessness, and invisibility. So we invited Dave and Adjua to come and be in conversation tonight because um, both of them in their work, among many other things, um, focus on climate, the environment, weather, poetry, community. Um, so as I said, I'm really excited to hear from them in just a minute. Um, after we're done kind of going back and forth with a conversation where I'll ask them questions, we'll do a brief Q&A for folks here and who are joining us over Zoom. And then I'm actually really excited. I'm going to turn over the mic to one of our students, um, Dominic Bayido, who's written a poem um, in response to Lorna Simpson's video. And after Dominic finishes, Adjua will come back up and do a brief poetry reading of her own work, and that'll kind of conclude the program for tonight. So a lot of different <laughs> components going on. Um, for y'all who are here in person, after the event, we'll have a reception in the lobby. So we hope that you'll join us there. And I think on that note, I'm just going to read a brief bio for both of you, and then I'll stop talking so that we can get into the conversation. Uh, so Dave is a meteorologist, author, and college instructor who has worked as a meteorologist for more than 35 years. He currently forecasts for the Boston Globe, WBZ, as well as WBUR, all in Boston, and his daily podcast, Weather Wisdom, is available on multiple platforms. Um, Dave is a Colby alum, class of 1986, and has been teaching a meteorology Jan Plan course here at Colby since 2006. He's also the founder of Bloomscapes, a landscape design company, and Growing Wisdom, an online video website for homeowner gardeners and landscape professionals. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. And then um, Adjua writes ethnobotanical literary criticism and collages detritus into heraldic devices engaging ever-expanding networks of references through the granular analytics of poetic inquiry. She's the author of Post Reading is Forestry and of Forest and of Farms on Faculty and Failure, and is also anthologized in Letters to the Future, Black Women in Radical Writing. She performs frequently across a broad spectrum of venues and educational contexts and is currently a candidate for the MFA in Poetry in the Literary Arts Program at Brown University. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be speaking with both of you. <laughs> okay, so thank you for being here. Um, I think first off, I want to start the conversation just from uh, hearing from both of you how you came into your particular line of work and sort of what drew you to engaging with climate 
weather, environment, botany, anything that you want to share. I don't know, Adwa, if you want to start us off. Sure. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been it's been great to kind of think about how to express this. Um, something that I've been realizing is that there's almost no aspect of my creative life and kind of aesthetic life um, that doesn't feel connected to what it means to be an animal on this planet. You know, that's, I'm, I've been wondering about that for a very long time in many different ways. And um, what it's looking like for the most part is, you know, documentary photography, um, lyric essay, um, gardening and collage, like that's the co collection. Um, but the through line of, um, you know, watching, watching, uh, how can I say this? The through line of watching myself and also the material around me um, kind of become acclimated to more time on earth um, has made me um, kind of overwhelmed in the planning of coming here. I'm overwhelmed with uh, recognition for how much the idea of, of weathering is um, always, you know, has always been what I'm interested in. Like, what does it mean to be here? Feels like um, the entirety of that question if you get to the spirit of it. So um, that's the atmosphere of this um, the answer, but the specifics are that I, um, you know, I, I went to a, I went to a secondary school that um, really had us doing literary criticism pretty early and um, without saying that that's what it was. And so <laughs> I've been, I've just been reading, you know, I've just been reading really closely since I was 12, you know, and, um, and that also means that I, um, you know, my relationship to language is, um, has been pretty granular for a long time. I'm really grateful for that because of the kind of reader and writer it makes me. And um, I'm in this MFA program now because it seems like uh, in all of the different art forms, poetry is one that is um, like one of the most expansive ones and the one that seems so far to be present in like kind of every field of inquiry somewhere. So I'm very happy to be where I am, but that's generally how I got here. <laughs> yeah, I love that word expansive for poetry. When I was coming up with the title, I realized mm. I'm like poetics is the most useful term of it's all amazing. time. Yeah. Like it just it captures is. anything yeah. that you want it to be a part of. Yeah. yeah. I was really happy to see way. that language yeah. so prominent also because that's <laughs> a really that's a little bit of an arcane word, you know? Like yeah. it's not uh, I'm glad that it's getting more <laughs> play. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. What about you, Dave? You, you know, similarly, I think that I since I was a little kid, I've always been sort of fascinated by the environment, the world yeah. around me whether it's plants or animals or, or weather and it's been one of those things that i've always been curious about how is it happening you know yeah. how how is the flower coming out why yeah. is the tree changing yeah look how different it looks I, we had a tree in our yard fall in irene in 2011 and i left mm. it i just cut a little piece so i could walk through it and i've been mm. watching it. i was having this conversation wow. with a woman uh, who's 92 yesterday about how over the past decade, I've just sort of watched it change yeah. and it's weathering, right? It's, yep. it's changing and it's, mm -hmm. it's because of heat and cold and snow and sun and uh, some things have moved into it and some things moved out. And, mm. and, and so for me, it just continues to be uh, interesting to try to figure out, you know, what's happening, whether it's on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, is it how much rain are we going to have tonight? Mm -hmm. Or it's, you know, what is the climate going to look like in a decade from now? Yeah. Um, you know, how will, how will my life be different because in a decade it'll be warmer and what will change mm -hmm. and how will my, something as simple as my wardrobe change, but how will it affect other people around me? Yeah. So I continue to be just sort of curious about 
all of this. Um, and again, I love the fact that you talked about just, you know, plants and animals and us. And, you know, I just mm -hmm. feel like I'm just this small little yeah. observer yeah. in everything around me. Totally. Yeah. You know, what's funny, Dave, is like someone working in the arts, what you're describing in your backyard, I'm like, oh, that's a durational environmental <laughs> work. Like, <laughs> it just sounds like a decade-long performance that we have going on there. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. Um, that's amazing. So it's, I, I love grounding the conversation and what you're both working on and thinking about. Um, so, and, and sort of a follow-up to what you're both describing as kind of your daily practice or the way you locate yourself and your work in the world. Um, I'm wondering if either of you want to share anything that emerged for you in visiting the exhibition that you feel like related to your own work. Sure, you can go first for this one. <laughs> so I, I think the, the you and I talked about this. So for, for folks that don't know, I when I teach here, I bring my students here. And we actually were one of the first groups to, to see, to see yeah. this back in January. And, and the, the painting on the back wall, I think, is the one that, that for me, I connected with the most. Um, my daily routine is that I take, with my dog in the morning, I take about an hour walk. And I do it very purposefully. And it's in, it's in very quiet space and not on roads. And I end up at a, at a top of a hill. And I can kind of see out. And, and that's, even though that there's a little more sort of chaos there with the fog or the, you know, the, the way that the lights playing it reminds me of that sort of morning peacefulness that i experienced so that's the that's the painting which you know if i were gonna walk home with one that's the i probably couldn't fit it in my pocket but that's the one that i would like to have security don't listen yeah <laughs> <laughs> what about you Angela? that's so great um you know it's the it's the scale and like the surprise of scale um that generally reaches me and absolutely that one um that one was the first that took me in but i didn't know i didn't know how large um lorna's piece was and was just you know like i felt like almost like genuflecting to it you know it was really like i didn't know that it would feel mountainous and that um that's been yeah i'll talk more about scale um you know later in our conversation but but um that's definitely the one and and maybe since all of these are in rest you know retro in uh communication with that piece i would say um maybe the calder um maybe the calder otherwise because there's a um duration over time of the invention right like calder didn't have to exist or have that idea or follow it through um but they did and so we we now have this new thing that you know anybody can do and, in, and many people um make them but it's you know that was such a random occurrence mm -hmm. and then it's such a ubiquitous form now and so i'm also thinking about um chance and scale in that way over time that's really lovely yeah um i i didn't actually know until semi recently for folks who are here like that calder uh, so we have a mobile up in the corner if you're watching on zoom that he's essentially pioneered that form like i think of it as something that's kind of always been with us yeah so it's amazing to think like that an, an artist actually like that this came from someone's brain and not that long ago and not that long ago yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so i want to talk a little bit more about um cloudscape specifically since that was kind of mm -hmm. like the impetus for the show um and in a way that i think really ties into a lot of um what both of you have kind of mentioned with your own work um so there's a reading of cloudscape that i think came up a lot in your class dave um and that I've talked about with other visitors and students. Um, so a lot of folks have described the whistling that happens in that video as feeling really mournful in a way, hmm. or like have experienced it almost as an elegy. And 
the way that I've kind of, that interpretation has sat with me is that in part that's informed by the rest of the show being about these like depictions of the environment and the atmosphere and sort of engaged with the weather. And I think a lot of people um, are kind of, you know, reading the performers whistling and gradual disappearance kind of in relation to thinking about climate change. Um, and that's been something that like several students have mentioned to me. Um, and something that I really appreciate about that interpretation is that for me, it kind of gets at like what art can do, which is I feel like put a visual um, to experiences or questions that aren't like easily verbalized. Um, so questions that I'm thinking about with the interpretation of that work is um, what do we envision when we imagine our environmental futures? Um, what does it sound like to mourn the environment? Um, what is it? What does environmental loss look like? Um, so these questions have, um, I think really been nurtured in like class visits that we've had here at Colby. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm curious how each of you kind of approach grappling with climate disruption and climate displacement in your own work. Um, and what kinds of questions you sort of find yourself asking about these issues. Just a nice, easy question Super. for both of you. <laughs> yeah, I get a two-part two -part answer. Um, one of the ways I grapple with it is that I forget all the time, you know? Um, and I know that that's culturally informed. Like, I know that that's, you know, there's a kind of persistence of the conversation, but there's, yeah, but it's a lot of talk, right? So I forget all the time. And then when I remember, get pretty sad. And I recognize that um, it's actually not sad, but it's like sad and scared. And I recognize that um, like, it's not something that's happening in the future, that it's something that's happening in the future sort of it's it's like you know the beginning of um the disruption is reaching my life in um north america you know at in a living in you know originally living in new york city um the weather feels kind of like decoration you know like, like there's so much other energy happening there that um, what's happening in the natural world is um, the scale is just really different generally. Um, and then something like Hurricane Sandy will happen and it will shut everything down or blizzard. And so like there are some reminders there. But I also, when I get sad and scared about the future for me, I also recognize that like other people who live with more material or regional precarity, um, you know, it, you know, it's already it's already disastrous for them in a long term way. You know, like the future that we're scared of is is present for a lot of people around the globe already. And um, I I just I kind of find some pause or peace to like, you know, to keep me from spiraling down into just like a depression about that. Um, just recognizing that um, the work that I'm doing is at least point and maybe some part of our species like towards a reckoning with our interconnection with the natural world. And that doesn't mean that um, will change anything, but it does, I think, start to shift towards accepting it. And um, yeah, I could say more about like, you know, it's not accepting it with surrender, like, oh, whatever we can do, whatever we want, but just kind of like accepting that our species just didn't figure out how to stay here properly. Like this is the end of us in a really weird, real, way and accepting um, and 
uh, accepting and getting little by little more comfortable with um, the fact that this is ending. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's so heavy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think like um, what you're saying, it's like I feel it also when I think about that kind of interpretive lens that I was talking about when I engage with that work. Mm -hmm. And it's like I, all those sensations are kind of echoed. Summer nights in July in 1721, but now we have 10 times the number of hot summer nights in July yeah. than we yeah. had. And I think the way that I like to use the art, uh, there's the, the sort of abstract art where you can get people to think about things like that. But then there's actual, there's pieces of art here in this museum, um, you know, Maya Lin's piece, where you can actually see uh, her interpretation using marble of the shrinking ice caps and so by looking at that piece of art and then talking about you know what how does the student feel what what this her piece of art stopped years you know several years ago at this point would she add another smaller piece to the mm. top or you look at chelsea and ice where you see part of that river frozen which hasn't frozen in 60 years mm. so the art which is an older painting shows past climate and how that's changed. So mm -hmm. I think th those are moments where I can sort of point it out to not, to your point, to not try to overwhelm because I think that it can be an overwhelming thing, especially for y younger folks who yeah. see more of their life ahead of them, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and the older you are, you might, not, you might not be as concerned because you know, you've got more of your life behind mm -hmm. you. So I, I think that's also purpose, the way I purposely think about it. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why I thought like bringing you two into conversation would be so great is because I feel like in both your work you're bo you're both thinking about like care in a way or like in how mm. you're indexing the the current moment and sort of like reflecting it like how you're delivering that I think I don't know I just felt like there was a really interesting resonance there between like what you both I'm do. I'm really happy about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is sort of a follow up question although I feel like. You started to kind of get into this, Dave, which is um, I'm thinking about how folks in the arts um, and poets and scientists and um, writers can like really inform each other to strengthen public understanding about these issues. And then I also think, um, you know, sort of recognize common goals. Hmm. Um, and I'm wondering if you see that like happening in either of your fields or how you think about working with like folks outside of your discipline or do you think about working with um, folks outside of your discipline? Yeah. I, I mean, one example that quickly comes to mind is, and I, I was sort of surprised in the way that this happened was uh, a series of doctors from, were studying down in Harvard a case about a particular bacteria that had um, harmed a fisherman in the Gulf of Maine. And the reason that bacteria was there in the first place was because of climate change. Mm. So they were presenting the case. And so they asked me to present sort of this small little climate piece. And so I was listening to all these doctors mm. talk about things which were completely going over my head, but then I was helping to put in perspective why this particular form of bacteria was actually present in the waters that had not been seen up in this latitude. Right. So I, I think that, you know, here's you have health professionals and I'm a meteorologist. And so there was an intersection, mm -hmm. an intersection there. And obviously I did talk about, you know, I think artists, poets, writers, I think it can be a softer 
way in which to engage hmm. people in messaging hmm. rather than you know having them read a journal which could you know be dry or go over mm -hmm. their heads or, or or sometimes it can be too hard of a touch yeah totally yeah i like that softer, softer yeah touch. yeah <laughs> i um i was thinking about um the conversation we were having before about um my entering undergrad assuming that i was going to be a biomedical engineer and like what you know <laughs> it didn't it didn't happen but not because like i didn't want it to just the way they were teaching it was so aggressive <laughs> um and i just i realized that um you know there's there's a kind of i had this i had this idea that I would be an artist and marry a scientist. That was like my <laughs> next plan. <laughs> it was like, how do, I, how do I keep this in my life? And then I had this really sad experience where I, I like, there was a, a genetic scientist when, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, the, I don't even know what kind of thing it was, but it was called CRISPR, something about gene oh, something. Oh, sequencing. Yeah. yeah. So there was, um, no, it was it was somebody else whose name I don't remember, and you'll find out why in just a moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like, heard about this lab and these innovations on um, This American Life or on Radio Lab, and then I, or, or maybe both, and then um, I saw the same person like on a PBS kind of video documentary thing. And then I saw them, I saw this person at Whole Foods. <laughs> and, I, and I walked up to him, this is exactly what I said. I walked up to him and I said, oh, you're my favorite scientist. <laughs> and this man said to me, am I the only scientist you know? <laughs> I was what? so upset. I mean, I was just like shocked and embarrassed in the moment, and I don't know what I said, but I was like, oh, that like cute little beautiful moment. Like, I was like, what went wrong? Like, A, <laughs> he must have been just like having a bad day, but also probably was in a PR crush and like, you know, was instant was like recently famous and like over it, you know? <laughs> but but I was like, I, you know, I was thinking, I was like, what like my my plan is not gonna work. You know, <laughs> like I need to be an artist that's in conversation with scientists. That was my whole point. You know, I wanted to be a <laughs> biomedical engineer because I loved scanning electron microscopy images and I loved how beautifully my textbook was written and I loved sitting in the park thinking about what's going on, you know? And then I met this actual scientist who like didn't want to hang out, you know, or like, you know, and I was like, what's going on? And then I realized a little bit later, I was like, oh, okay, so it's not maybe, I mean, I generalized because I was hurt, but I was like, maybe it's not a scientist that I want to talk, uh, you know, partner with, but like somebody like Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson, like a science popularizer, you know, like that's that, that kind of thing, like when, like all the things that artists do to get into the schools and teach young people about contemporary art practices and thinking and all the things that um, scientists do that also bring their ideas into common parlance like that that interaction is always so important for me and for the culture and that's that's where that's it's always in the communications and it's i mean it's not pr for capitalist stake, but PR for like everybody needs all the information always. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's one of the things that I like really enjoy about being at Colby because they're colleagues in so many various departments. But they when they bring, you know, like you mm. bring your class into the museum, it's like you hear this perspective from someone in the sciences or yeah. like working in and you think there's not a tie in and then Oftentimes, those are like the best yeah. conversations. Yeah. Has that? Has anyone ever approached you at the grocery store, recognizing you from <laughs> reporting the weather? Oh yeah, yeah. Did, did you respond more positively? I, I, I think, er, er, to be honest, early in my career, when it first started happening, it is a little like you're just like, whoa, somebody's yeah. 
somebody you're not in that space where somebody's actually coming to you yeah and i think now that i've been doing it this long i, I tend to be much more thank you and yeah. i appreciate it i'm <laughs> glad you watch me and this is great and you know just much i would be much kinder yeah, to you thank if you, you. Came. and i would thank be in you. whole foods you, you would know, be in Whole Foods, yeah. yeah, you know, it's like strawberries or something. People are generally so yeah. chill in Whole Foods, but no, not this one, yeah. Um, I, I have like so many more questions prepared, but I actually think we're kind of like right around the time for okay. the Q&A, Q&A, maybe one more. Great. Um, oh, geez, let's see here. <laughs> okay, um, I think this will be a good one to close with. So Adjua, um, I want to read just like a short piece of writing that, sure, that yeah. I thought really resonated. Um, I hope I do it justice. Um, and I think it connects with the show and Thank we you. can talk about it. Um, what becomes possible when we begin to center and attempt responses to the slow and silent, mm -hmm. active and occluded voices and spirits of the plant life we live alongside? How might what emerges on the page and our minds from our mouths and out of our hearts parallel what we already know? In the futures that follow, what might verdancy feel like to all of Earth's beings and to all of the cosmos's material and immaterial bodies when so-called weeds are on the mantle as well as in the crevices? Which is amazing, right? Um, <laughs> so that really resonated for me. And I think our conversation, like we totally touched on why already. But when I read that, I was thinking about um, something that you both talked about, which is like our place within this world, right? Yeah. Like humanity within this larger ecosystem. Um, and I think that there are a lot of works in the show that kind of like reflect some of what I feel like is in this text for me to go back to this drawing that we keep talking about, which for uh, people who are tuning in virtually is um, Cao Chao Ching's um, Vernal Equinox. Um, the first time I saw that, like, Kind of the opposite of your intimate read, Dave, I, I was really struck by kind of the scale of the mountains next to the mist. And for me, it just brought me to this moment of like, our time is so short compared to this yeah. geological yeah. moment, right? But I love that we had this like different um, experience of it. But I think all that is to say that um, your text, when it talks about attuning to the slow and the silent and the occluded, just felt like so appropriate to mm. kind of bring up. And I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about what you're exploring with those ideas. Um, and this could, I think even the sort of, to build on that question, <coughs> something that both of you could even respond to if you wanted, Dave, which is thinking about what responses to the voices and spirits of plant life might look like. Um, or what it would look like for weeds to be on the mantle, which yeah. is like my favorite. That's it's my like favorite. I've got to That's, put that yeah. expression in my pocket mm, for thank you. future thank years. You. Yeah. yeah, that was my that that struck me. The the weeds in the crevices, the weeds in the mantles. Yeah. I, I was gonna say, can you flush that up yeah. a little bit? Like how what that <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's the most visual thing. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I okay. So. I think um, I really want to be careful because I feel like if I just started saying this, like we'd be here till like four in the morning. <laughs> um, so I just want to say that I want people to keep in mind, um, maybe some of you have um, in secondary school encountered a book called A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, that one. Um, and then uh, um, in many circumstances, I think actually right here, does anyone see my tablet? Oh yeah, here. Um, in many circumstances, I, um, I wear this, uh, this sweatshirt. Um, which some of you will recognize from a Beyonce video. Um, but let's see. Yeah, okay. So this sweatshirt, it's, you know, it's got a lot of different stuff on it. It kind of looks like it says Yale, but it actually says, oh, yeah. So it kind of looks like it says Yale, right? But it actually says Kale, right? 
Um, and um, I, off, I, I love that switch. I love the play of that. Um, but I will just say that, the, I will say, ask me anything you want to, um, you know, at the cocktail thing afterwards. But uh, an example of weeds being on the mantle versus the crevices is like, that's already happening, you know? Like kale used to be ornamental. Now it's, you know, a cash crop, I don't know. Um, now, you know, now it's a, a class indicator also. Like, you know, it's a real, it's, it's, it's use to us has totally changed, um, but that's just about us you know that's that's just about how we are thinking about it and um where i live in brooklyn or where i last lived in brooklyn um this beautiful old building in park slope and there's a problem where um there's a, a very very robust weed that um the the people who who currently own the building they can't get it to stop growing and it is it is compromising the architectural um you know it is it's it's damaging the the front patio and maybe even the stoop of the next door but like they can't get it to stop growing without getting the city to you know come and undo the sidewalk and then like dig it up <laughs> Um, and it turns out that that's an invasive weed, but it also turns out that that invasive weed was not native to, you know, did not, um, you know, that invasive, that plant, I want to, I don't even want to call it an invasive weed, that plant has been on this continent for like less than 200 years. Um, or maybe, or maybe just about 200 years. I think it was like 1830s. People started um, bringing it here for their greenhouses and gardens because it was valued um, and it was from China. And people wanted to be like, "Look, I have the money and taste and discernment to like get this thing here," and they brought it into their greenhouses and it escaped. And it's now <laughs> everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, and you can look this up and then you know just find out what it looks like and then you will just see it's everywhere it's like wallpaper it's it's um it's really interesting to me that this is not thought of as like a successful plant you know like an invasive you know it's it's just perception and it was valued in china it has like silk it has like silk making um, connotations or relationships, but just just to really put a really fine point on it, the resilience of this plant is such that it's the species that's the central metaphor of that book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, because you cannot kill it, or like, you know, you can't, you can't stop its like onward movement and a tree grows in Brooklyn is um, about it's like a European um, a early 20th century European immigrant success story like that's the that's the thing of it and so it's just it's really. Um, they're on the mantle they're in the crevices at the same time, you know, we are it's us it's always us. Yeah, <laughs> it's like. Yeah, it's so much to think about there, but I love that you use the word escaped to describe what a plant did. Yeah. Like I never think about um, like plant life and, and plant matter as like having that kind of agency. Yeah. I don't know, that's yeah. just, yeah, it's <laughs> such a different way of thinking about our surroundings. Yeah. yeah. Should we turn it over really quickly to questions? Thank you both so much. I think we probably have time just for like a question or two. We can also take questions from the virtual audience. Yeah. So if folks are watching, you can put something into the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. So I have one question okay. that um, as we think about poetics in the atmosphere, how would you suggest that we critically think about art and nature as it depicts Critically think about art and nature as it depicts and impacts. 
a good question. Um, I want to think about that for a second. Do you have an answer or do you want to think about it for a second? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess I can jump in. Yeah. I would say I hear a lot. I was just talking with a, a student here about this idea of like painting being so wasteful, like certain types of sculpture being so wasteful because we're using, you know, these materials that to make something that is doesn't necessarily have like a concrete use value, mm. right? And I had this moment where I was like, I've never felt so torn. Like, I totally agree with you. Like, in the moment, they're bringing me along and I'm like, yeah, stop painting. We don't need it anymore. <laughs> like, let's move on to other forms. But then at the same time, like, I was kind of pushing against this notion of like, sort of to go along with this idea of the weed or something like yeah. that things have to have a you know art yeah. is useful it obvious of course um i think that so um <laughs> but i think that there are a lot of really incredible artists um i'm looking at for people who are tuning in over zoom i'm looking at one of our lender institute resident um artist fellows who works uh sophronia Downing, who works a lot with clay that's harvested from the local environment and uses that to make work and thinking about folks who are, um, I think, making work that really addresses and does think critically about like this environmental moment that we're in and then also reflect that in the way that they're making the work. Yeah. So it's not just like the concept, but it's also like um, embedded into the material. Yeah, and I, I think that's really exciting it's a little it's a little about balance too i mean the the you know if if we it would be a pretty sad existence if everything we did was just totally right so yeah. sometimes you have to be a little bit frivolous and sometimes you have to do things just for the sake of being human it's part of the human experience and it's part it's part of what what brings joy to life and you know if we're, we're now going to say you can't use paintings because you know what what's the use of the painting right mm -hmm. i mean what's the use of a lot of things right i mean yeah. um but i think that i think that art and writing and all of those things can be used to educate and to bring forward an idea and to bring a discussion like even in that moment that you had with mm -hmm. that student you were able to it hones your idea even better it makes you think about how you would answer that question a little bit better and i think that you know the challenge mm -hmm. the challenge can make us better at informing us but it can also make you better at being more articulate about whatever your idea yeah. is if someone's pushing back that can be okay as well yeah and i love that you use the word joy because i'm just thinking of just really quickly like also um how needed to have moments with our, like that are not addressing you know these pressing issues but mm -hmm. just give a, it opens the window and gives you a little bit of like fresh air right yeah. so yeah, that, yeah you know, museums and spaces where you can have those encounters or books or, you know, whatever, like that's so important no matter what the, the um, like ideas and the artwork are, if it gives you that, that moment. I'll give you one quick example. You know, sometimes it can be 75 degrees in February and that's probably has a climate change footprint to it. But that doesn't mean you can't go outside and enjoy your 75 degree day. You don't have to stay inside mm. and just, mm -hmm. Be depressed that it's 75 and that the climate is changing so you can be aware mm -hmm. you can also go out for a walk and yeah. be like this is a break in the winter and yeah. i'm going to enjoy this yeah and both can be true yeah i think that's really yeah. important i think i think for me there's um it doesn't always feel like a nuanced question but it is um i mostly I mostly think I well the artwork that I'm that I feel most inspired by is is um, you know addressing it's not an escape you know mm -hmm. um and so I think that this person's talking about um, made from the environment and also in, what was it impacting and yeah yeah nature that depicts and impacts. Depicts and impacts, yeah. I just love that pairing. Um, depicts and impacts. It's like, you know, uh, people 
you know, there's, it's stressful to think about how much, how many lithium batteries are being, or how much lithium is taken out of the earth and it's at the right pace and not like, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the sharing of information, mm -hmm. you know, is the same, you know, those same devices are going to make it more possible that we will culturally get on the same page faster, right. you know? So I feel like the fact that they're, um, they're kind of always interacting, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Move on to the poem. Yeah, I feel like we should move on to the poem. So thank Great. you so much, oh, thank Angela you. and Dave. Thank you. Um, thank yeah. you all. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce uh, Dominic Bayido, who is a Colby student and who's going to share a poem that he wrote about Lorna Simpson's cloudscape called Thinking of the Key. I'm gonna, yeah, sit wherever you want. I'm gonna drop <laughs> over here. They all left, they all left me. <laughs> it was really great, it was really great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wrote this poem inspired by the video installation. I spent like an hour in there, just like writing down notes. And yeah. then that night I dreamt of the whistling. <laughs> it didn't even scare me. <laughs> no, that scared me. <laughs> okay. Thinking of the key. Why do men on silk screens remind me of prayer? Why do the voices ring around my mind in scattered circles like skipping stones on slack rivers? What of the waves from that forbidden sea? Notice his eyes are always closed, straight legs sprouting from shadows like black flowers, petals curling their edges at penumbras. But this light is not dull enough to dungeon me. It's not enough to cage the sound of my mother's song, where those spirits of Sunday mornings clung to her tongue. Her whistles pierce even the toughest of God's reign. She rejects the myth of time. Like how we used to wipe wooden floors to Eddie Santiago, when I knew her arms as warmth rather than words. She always let me ask questions I couldn't yet answer, like, is sound only alive when it touches us? Like stars projecting into the midnight curtain above me? Or does it stack itself in patient squares when we refuse to listen? Like water, it runs down the ceramic tub, splashing at hair, curling into question marks. My mother wipes, she whistles, and the notes carry the lullaby she stowed next to my ribs, the cut of sleep she promised each night, that if I prayed and if I thanked my angel de la guarda, dulce compañía, no me deje solo, ni de noche, ni de día, I would be saved. Can you save the disappeared God? Or are you still not listening? Even when the fog envelops us, we return each time with our hands intact, our lips open and plump. The thread between us kept winding around the lungs of the earth, because to be loud means there is breath left in you. There is time to let her take your hand and cup your head, whispering into your hair, sana, sana. Colita de rana. Si no sana soy, sanarás mañana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Thanks for sharing your words with us. Um, and just one more time to reintroduce Adwa and invite her up to read some poems for us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, normally I would stand, but I don't want to. So. <laughs> Um, I was, let's see, it was early, no, it was late summer 2019, and I got this email from um, an editor at The Believer, and they told me that they were asking if I would be interested in um, writing an essay about the weather, and of course, I was like, 
yes. <laughs> I've been waiting for this my whole life. Um, but it turns out that there was this series um, called Pattern and Forecast um, from the Believer. And um, I, and I did not end up publishing this essay with the Believer. I would like to still, but I, you know, the editor said it was complete and I knew that there's so much more that I needed to say that I didn't, I never sent the email being like, okay, I'm done with it. You know, they, they were like, you're done with it. And I was like, no, dude. you know, so I, I want to read, um, I want to return to this um, and experience it with you. Um, and it, it, it's still in a kind of fragmentary um, state of it. Yep. Thank you. Whoever. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yep. And um, I wonder if you will, um, could I ask your help? Could, yeah. Um, I don't want to read all of it. I want to just um, maybe seven minutes-ish um, and then uh, just kind of let it end. But could you just... Um, Somehow, let I'll me know. You okay, I will okay. sort of look. I'll make it big. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Attention has its origin in an impalpable fog. Rainy days, we become plants. Etel Adnan. Etel. 14,352 out of 36,525. Last night on the way to bed, still considering how to enter the idea of weather, Frederick called me from atop the calyx. Eyes lit upon six of the eight leaves. Sudden wordless clarity approaching I am your weather, flashed through the neurosphere. I entered the bedroom and lay down for sleep, glad to know a shape of what I would write for you. En route to work the next morning, I resumed reading Robert Pogue Harrison's Gardens, an essay on the human condition, Chicago, 2008. Commute entertainment identical to the previous days. Yesterday, I didn't know it was raining until the second, third, fourth, and fifth drops of water hit the first pages of Pogue Harrison's chapter, The Vocation of Care. The first drop could have been anything. Wasn't. Was rain. By the time I got to work, the accumulation of drops dampening 40 degrees north, 74 degrees west, were considerable enough that Sherry greeted me with a smiling, well, it's Wednesday and it's raining. And we enjoyed confirmation of my, <laughs> of my emerging theory, it rains on Wednesdays in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> At the peak, I mean, honestly, I just, I do I just want to pause to say, like, during that summer, there was, like, a downpour every Wednesday. It was, like, very noticeable. Um, at the peak of my houseplant care practice, I would water everyone on Sunday mornings. At the peak of the peak, I'd also play the extraordinary Stevie Wonder's journey through the secret life of plants, Tomla Motown, 1979, for additional connective effect. I hear some nodding. I see some nodding. A favorite aspect of the ritual, Saturday evening's water preparation, allowing fluorine and chlorine gas to, allowing fluorine and chlorine to gas off overnight before soil contact the next day. Glowed with the confidence of reliability in those days. The inconvenience of considering floral consciousness is obvious. When I have heard new vegans declare, I don't eat anything with a face, or even the more misguided, or the even more misguided, 
I don't eat anything that has parents. I only hear narcissism. I only hear the limits of empathy. As this summer was ending, the regularity was startling. Four and maybe five weeks in a row, a Wednesday evening rush hour rainstorm sent sheets of water across Bushwick Avenue. Imagine if you do not remember a boring late summer day in a dense, Imagine if you do not remember a boring late summer day in a city dense with the hand of man, when suddenly the force of all that is older, larger, and more powerful than we great bougie apes, oh my God, that's so funny, than we, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Imagine if you do not remember a boring, late summer day in a city dense with the hand of man, when suddenly the force of all that is older, larger and more powerful than we great bougie apes clobbers us in an undertow of humility. I love it. We need it. Atmosphere as dumb. <laughs> Rainstorms are the kind of weather I think looks best on this city, theatrical, ion shifting, hygienic, transparent, temporary. Remember, you are nothing. Now get back to your great works. A decade ago, a life coach prompted a group of us to describe our favorite aspect of the natural world. I wish I still had that piece of paper with the notes I made on clouds. Shape-shifting, fortune-telling, transitory hydro sculptures, variously adorable and formidable, variously familiar and elusive. The life coach's big reveal. The natural element we'd chosen for the exercise is the one we most closely identify with. Okay, thank you. Yes. Rain is the Beyonce of all weather. <laughs> the one you think of before you remember the rest. In order to remember the rest, the icon, the referent. I am sometimes amused when white bodied Americans of sundry, myriad European descent claim to have no culture, myth of existence as default. Much funnier still is an idea I don't recall the source of, the idea that a place like LA perhaps has no weather because there is no rain, myth of peace as absence. Funniest of all is the comment that a woman without an aerograph, funniest of all, is the comment that a woman without an hourglass figure doesn't have a body. Myth of disinterest as irrelevance. The foolishness of each of these oversights belies the impact of refraction and disruption. Not until I am an immigrant do I recognize the culture of my homeland. Not until rain check do I track my atmosphere's changes? Not until arousal do I notice your presence. I'll just um, read this last little part. If by weather we mean the condition of the atmosphere regarded as the subject, hmm. if by weather we mean the condition of the atmosphere regarded as subject to vicissitudes, that's from the OED, the first time I was the weather was the first time I learned houseplants can feel our presence, feel our failure. Near the door to our new apartment, a small unnamed pothos had fallen atop a pile of boxes, had fallen from atop a pile of boxes. My mother's response when she realized the displacement Oh, they hate that. <laughs> sudden crash of sentience, sudden crash of harm, 
sudden crash of interdependence. When Pogue Harrison writes of Adam and Eve's refractive error, for humans are fully human only when things matter. Chicago, 2008. I hear the ontological clutter of houseplant marketing for millennials. I hear the casual, cheerful cynicism of sales pitches and folk recommendations that lead with assumptions of negligence. This plant is hard to kill. Enjoy it in your loveless home today. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you. OK, that's such a great note to end on. Thanks again, everyone. Um, thank you, Dave and Adjwa. And thank you to my colleagues, Chris and Gabriel, especially for helping me to organize this event. Um, while I have you um, here and on Zoom, if you want to um, follow up this event with more art and poetry, we're actually hosting a free workshop for anyone in the community um, 13 or over on Saturday with uh, Colby professor Adam Gianelli, who teaches uh, creative writing and poetry. So that's at 1 p.m. Please come if you're interested. And then we'll have another art and event next Tuesday on our active site exhibition talking about photographs from the Sierra's family photography collection. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wow, so great.